What's up? We are back with the uh, Triage Method podcast. This week I am joined by a far more jacked Gary McGowan. <laughs> um, better looking, I would argue. Some people, maybe they like Gary's style. Like, I'm not here to judge. But we are joined by someone that... Uh, well, we'll let you introduce yourself in a second. Um, but we're going to talk about a few different topics today because over the next while we're going to talk a bit more about um, the non-nutritional science related stuff that you know goes into underpinning nutrition, right? Because we can be left thinking that it's all just calories and macros and micronutrients and all that kind of stuff, especially as it relates to you know health processes, disease processes, um, and you can be in that position where you effectively are you know, just thinking in terms of calories and macros. And you can have this thought process that you're kind of actually dissociated from the food, right? And this is something that you see, like obviously we coach coaches in the coaches corner and, you know, we're in the health and fitness industry. So, you know, we consume content within that industry. And also, you know, we're looking at what other people are doing. And you can find quite often it happens that people start talking about just calories and macros and never actually mention food, right? But then never even mention the the whole psychology, you know, the, the social stuff that goes into actually making a diet successful. And people can be left in a position where they effectively think it's all just calories and macros. And once you, you know, pop your numbers into a, a an equation and you get something spit out to you, you're like, all right, so that's it. That's the diet done, right? Which, you know, really couldn't be further from the truth in, in terms of what... Is actually required to you know engage in a successful diet right so with that introduction who are you <laughs> what do you do who do you coach why should people listen to you yeah all right thanks for that patty um like first of all if if you're just getting macros and just following the numbers like, you don't need a coach for that like you can you can google that so uh, that right. should that should say something first of all anyway my name is brian oengesa um i am a qualified nutritionist uh, university qualified in uh, ucd which is where you went as well patty um and i am the head coach and nutritionist in the fit clinic which is a online coaching company and consultancy service so we work with a wide wide range of people um we have a pretty big team, so a lot of different skill sets. So that allows us to cater for a lot of people. And I myself, I mean, I work with a wide range of people too, um, like, you know, from athletes and people just want to be fitter, healthier, leaner, all that good stuff. Um, but I also found myself working a lot with people who have a poor relationship with food um, and trying to help them overcome that. So a lot of that is kind of like, psychological um rather than like you were saying already just eat this food and your dreams will come true you know it's not it's not that simple if only it was because that would honestly make things so much simpler in terms of i could literally just give you calories and macros and that's not to say that that's a bad approach like i've done that before in terms of just giving someone like these are the calories and macros that we want you to hit and these are the targets but the actual coaching process itself like that is a, a process where you actually coach someone to engage in habits that allow them to hit those targets, right? Mm. And we'll talk about maybe habit-based change in, in a second, but there are obviously populations that do, like you said, have a, a poor relationship. I knew that was going to fall down. <laughs> um, they do have a, a poor relationship with either themselves and that manifests in uh, their relationship with food or they have a just poor relationship with food in general because of you know maybe the way they were raised you mm. know their, their family have always just you know we'll say over consumed food and um, or you know they've used food as a, a kind of crutch uh, to deal with emotions or you know whatever else is going on in their life like even if they're using it as a reward which is very frequent in terms of like people use food as a reward and that can be perfectly fine like you know you're yeah. you're celebrating like even in like feasts and stuff like you celebrate christmas with mm. food you know you celebrate easter with food and like yeah. all of those different things like they they do all um have a food component to them and that can be good that can bring people together however it can also put people in a position where they're not actually you know we'll say truthfully engaging with nutrition because they're 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 using food as a crutch to overcome and potentially reward 
their 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 life yeah. you know and, and they're not actually like i said truthfully engaging with food because it's not even enjoyment that's driving them you know mm. it's like okay well I, I i'm rewarding myself with food or again i'm i'm using it as a crutch to overcome these yeah. issues you know and they're not happy about that because like realistically if you're happy to continue to engage in those habits and you're like i don't want to change or whatever <laughs> like you're realistically not listening to this podcast <laughs> yeah right? i mean if you know it's not necessarily always detrimental oh 100 percent. you know it's like like i said like we use feast days and yeah. stuff like that and like if it's not impacting your life like negatively yeah i'm not one to pathologize things in terms of like right that's a negative you know while i might be like yeah that's probably a negative you know, I might think that that's not necessarily the advice I would give to someone. Like if they're able to engage with eating and they use food mm. as a crutch, sometimes they're like, they're sad. They're like, I have a little bit of ice cream, but ultimately it doesn't derail yeah. me from my, my goals in life. doesn't derail me from my, my health and fitness goals, you know, wh- whatever it is. They're like, maybe you could argue that it's a, a bad behavior, but, mm. but even uh, if it's not actually in- injurious to their lifestyle or their life, I'm like, like we all engage in stuff which yeah. is probably less than optimal so you know who cares at the end yeah. of the day however and this is why we wanted to get you on there is a, a subsection of the population that they engage in habits that are probably detrimental to their goals right and that can be cause of a, a variety of things in terms of you know, again, maybe they have you know childhood trauma or something, or again, like we said, they have always just used food as a reward, or you know they their their family just always over consumes calories, mm. and that's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been, um, and that's how they learn to eat, right? So you obviously coach people that you know will say they have a a poorer relationship with food and i know people hate when you say a relationship with food but there's no other way to describe it because Mm. it is an intimate relationship with the food that you consume right like people basically have religions around food they're like oh i'm in the the carnivore cult i'm the the vegan cult like they're they're basically religions so there is clearly some sort of you know we'll call it a a being around food Mm. and, and people make an emotional connection with that and therefore we can say there's a relationship there right yeah so we touched on a few things there and there's two things I really want you just to kind of comment on first of all is first of all habit-based change and moving the conversation away from thinking of here's your calories and macros like we said at the start and yeah. actually thinking in terms of what are the habits we can engage in to actually hit those those targets you know again like you can use the scientific process to come up with the the ideals or whatever you want to call them and then you have to actually coach the individual in front of you to engage in habits to actually hit those targets but also i want you to then if you will uh, (laughs) move that conversation into actually coaching those habits with people that struggle with you know just nailing the basics because that's what people kind of make it out to seem like it's like all right once you do your calories and macros and you know you you, you engage in these habits you go to sleep earlier you know you get your steps in you do x y and z it's all going to be grand yeah which is fine like that's Mm -hmm. i want you to touch on that and be like there's your habits cool right but what do you do when you as an individual or you know we've a lot of you know coaches listening to this as well yeah what do you do if the person you're trying to give these habit-based recommendations so that they can hit these targets or whatever ideal diet that you want to have them on how do you actually coach someone again it could be yourself as well yeah to actually adhere to that you know, mm-hmm. like, well, what's the, the conversation you need to have with someone or the conversation you need to have with yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with that in mind, you need to look at where are the limiting factors? And what what might they be? Um, because if you if I tell you to go and do X, Y, Z with your habits, um, but you, you, you can't do it for whatever reason, you're not able to stick to it. We have to examine why that might be the case. And, you know, as a coach, I always uh, scrutinize my own protocol first. I'm not going to say, you know, Paddy's lazy or, yeah. you know, he's too dumb to, to get together and, and do this. Like, it's going to be, say, okay, is there anything wrong with the, with the plan um, that, that implementation is being such a struggle? Now, a lot of this, I think, is meeting a person where they're at currently. Um, because I think a big problem with this is people set the bar so high for themselves Um they're trying to run before they can walk so to speak and 
in doing that, they set themselves up to just fail over and over and over again. Now, I find this really interesting because it's it's something that you put on yourself. So you say, okay, these are you know maybe maybe your coach gave you targets, mm-hmm. but if a coach gives you targets, you know hitting them that should be adjusted. That's the, that's the coaching process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But say say an individual gives themselves these targets. Okay, so I have to tick these boxes. Um, very often, it's almost perfection or, or nothing mm. so very often it's perfection that's required so this is something i often ask people is okay how do you define a successful day or week mm. um of eating or just in in the process in general and see what they come back and say and then you can see from that it's like okay so you've identified here that um if you eat any quote-unquote junk food uh that week is a failure mm. um that that's a problem and that's I said I find it interesting because that's just people doing that to themselves, mm. uh, shooting themselves in the foot. And that's why I give the advice to set the bar low enough so you actually, actually clear it. You start to build that sense of self-efficacy. I can do this. You start to generate some positive momentum. And you can keep moving forward, keep getting better and better and better. Um, but, you know, if you say, you know, I need to, I need to go run 30 miles today. And you can't run ten. Hmm. Uh, you're gonna feel pretty shit about that. Yeah, like okay. I think the the analogy to like gym work or training and stuff like really works well to tie this in in terms of like you wouldn't just go in and go right. I don't know where you're at like as a coach. Um, let's just load up you know three plates aside on the bench press there. We'll see if you can do it. Hmm. You know, like <laughs> that that would be a terrible approach. Yeah. Right? So why would you do that with the diet? And again, like you said, it it can be them doing it to themselves in terms of they're like this is my idealized this is what I should be doing, mm. you know? Um, maybe again, it's like, I should be doing three plates on the bench, you know? Um, that's their idealized. And if they're like, oh, I only did two plates. Like they, that could be phenomenal for the vast majority of people. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm a failure because mm. I had this idea in my head, this like all or nothing. Uh, this is the, the target. If I don't get that, it's terrible. But I do really like that analogy to the gym because I think that it, it kind of solidifies things in people's yeah. minds a little bit easier because we do all have these biases and you know thought processes and around nutrition where it's like oh don't eat that or you know this is a good food or this is mm. a bad food but like realistically a lot of that is just self-imposed yeah yeah self-imposed a lot of the time um and if that's the case then you have to examine okay um you know if you're a coach you have to examine okay what has your client said here uh as what their standards are essentially and then if, if you're doing this with yourself it's like okay are my standards here realistic based on where i'm at right now um you know because if you're going in to the gym starting with an empty bar and you're saying i have to squat squat 200 kilos or something you know you can't do that okay you failed but if you can only squat an empty bar and then you can move up to 50 kilos that's a pretty big Mm. increase like that's that's great so you need to apply that to your other habits um you know if you're sleeping four hours a night you know you're probably not going to sleep nine hours a night Mm. for the next you know three months in a row and you're gonna have to start building that up and either as a coach meet the person where they're at um you know i'll say to people okay well how about this um do you think you could do this or what do you think you could do in relation to this? so like you know if you're sleeping four hours a night do you think you could sleep five hours do you think you commit commit to that um and assess how you know ready they are to do that in the first place because there's always going to be trade-offs um for doing anything mm. and I think you have to be honest with yourself a lot of the time about what you really want uh, or for clients, you know, you need to be honest. Like, so maybe, maybe somebody doesn't want to give up drinking two bottles of wine at the weekend. Mm. Maybe they don't. And that's all right. Um, as long as they don't fool themselves into thinking that they want this other goal, like maybe, yeah. maybe this is limiting their fat loss or something like that. Mm. Um, but if they're not willing to trade that, as long as they're honest about that, um, otherwise they're going to feel very conflicted because you're like, okay, this behavior that I'm doing is setting me back, yet I know I want this goal of being like five mm. kilos lighter or leaner or whatever it is. Um, and this just on that as well, that's, this is something that you see quite a lot, especially if you are coaching people. We often think like, oh, I'm going to bring in an intervention, you know, drop calories, do whatever. And we just mm. assume that that's positive, that's right? That's okay. That, yeah. it's, like that there's no negatives associated with that. But like you said, that could actually be impacting someone's life. Like again, like maybe they do two balls one in the weekend. Maybe that's not what they're doing. But, you know, maybe they have a Sunday roast with their family, you know, and that's just where they engage with their family. You know, they're 
all spread all around their their county their state whatever it is but sunday 6 p.m they're all together mm. right and you're like no unless you follow exactly this food plan or we can't you're not going to get results you know you're in a bad position you're mm. the, what you thought was a positive intervention has now negatively impacted that person's relationships with others and thus themselves because yeah. you know they're missing out on that like socialization which is a huge part of what being a human is all about yeah. you know yeah so you know you have to you have to think about all these different factors it's not just as simple as like here are your, here are your macros go do them um you gotta look at the person who's in front of you and see where they're at and, and what type of person they are and then go to work on these habits right so you know if i say to you patty like I, I, what do you think about sleeping five hours and it's a lot of this a lot of the dialogue is not like do, do this. this yeah yeah it's patty what do you think about this do you think you'd be able to do that or even digging deeper because you might think like five hours of sleep that's that's fucking stupid right mm. but then you're like like why are you getting five hours of sleep do you not mm-hmm. know that more is beneficial and um, like maybe you wouldn't you know be like do you not know more is more <laughs> yeah. beneficial but you know you ask you're like oh you know that you know getting more would be beneficial and they're like yeah well i have to work two jobs because i have all this stuff you know and it's like mm. okay so now i've actually understood where you're at yeah. you know and i think that is something that's missed the, the human experience of mm. you know actually coaching people where you're not actually getting that information because you're like huh of course you should be getting eight hours of sleep yeah. are you dumb and then you ask you know okay so why is this person working two jobs mm. that'll give you some sort of insight into what their priorities actually are yeah. and often they again like i said if, if they feel like their behavior is conflicting with what they say they want to do they're going to feel like shit so if this person working two jobs their coach is telling them oh my god you're gonna mm. you're gonna die next year like if you don't start sleeping more um that's not helpful and rather than saying that and trying to scare them um, you know, help them see that, okay, you're working two jobs because, you know, you got two kids to raise by yourself. Uh, you need that income. They're your priority. Yeah. Okay. Obviously not. You're not going to mm. get enough sleep. And uh, that sounds kind of simple, but a lot of people they miss that. Yeah. They miss that and they just feel crap because they're not doing this thing that they think they should be doing. So if you can help them see, okay, these are actually my priorities. Therefore, um, they um, lead to these behaviors and this is where I'm at now. Mm. And then once you can accept where you're at, then you start looking at things you might be able to change that are going to be positive. So, you know, if sleep is, if it's not negotiable at the moment, you look at something else. All right. Mm. Can we make your, uh, can we at least make the quality of that sleep as good as possible? Mm. Like with different sleep hygiene methods. Um, maybe or like at, two jobs. You're like, okay, stress management. That's something that maybe we need to look at while we can't look at sleep, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Like, I think that is something that is, really missed by both coaches which you know arguably like that's their job they should be Mm. good at it you know that's why we have the coaches corner (laughs) shameless plug um but you know like arguably that's their job so they should be good at it but you understand why an individual they're like oh well i see all these fit fam instagram influencers or youtubers or whatever or you know they're getting their advice from celebrities who you know they have a personal chef and everything is micromanaged everything and they're like oh well x person said I have to do this to get results like they did. Like you can understand why mm. they can be left thinking like, oh, well, like I can't do everything perfectly. So I, I can't get results. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a case of seeing you know, what you can do. And like I said, the dialogue is, is a lot of trying to help people come to their own uh, solutions almost. So it's, it, a lot of the time, it's not like, Paddy, do this. It's, Paddy, what do you think you could do here um, that might be beneficial? Uh, if you aren't sure, you know, I have some ideas if you want to share them. Um, but, you know, that's the way like, I often look at it. Like, you can almost feel like you're not doing that much mm. as a coach, but you are. You're helping people come to their own solutions. And if they come to their own solutions, it's a lot more likely they are going to go ahead with it and the mm. implementation because they've got that autonomy, which is quite important. Um, so if they could, if you come up with something and you say, yeah, I'm going to do this. Okay. All right. What's, um, what's realistic for this? Like what kind of frequency, like I try and get very specific, mm. um, which I think is important because it's essentially setting a goal. Mm. If you're going to make a change, you're setting a goal. So it's important to get specific with it. And okay. So someone says, okay, I think I could eat more vegetables this week. Guys, what does that look like in practice? What do you think is realistic for you? But, uh, based on where you're at right now, what would be an improvement for next? Cause that's all we're looking for. I was we're just looking for 
improvements. You yeah. know, can you do a little better uh, this week than you did last week? And you can do that, and you keep stacking that week after week after week. Um, you're probably going to be in a much better place a few months down the line. Um, so yeah, it's like, what does that look like? And uh, and then you know, how are we going to measure that? How are we going to track that? And you know, I I've written some materials for our coaches. Um, you know, either when they sign up or you know, or not signed up, start working with us. Like there's a coaching manual uh, that I have, and it's like you know, it's explicitly stated like it's not good enough for you to just tell someone what to do you have to help them figure out how to implement it because that's what the coaching process is. is yeah like you're guiding them like i really like the analogy of a, a ship's captain and a navigator so like you know you're, it's your boat you're the captain you're sailing it where you want to go um you know i can give you direction uh, and help you figure out which direction might be best for you but if you say, you know, fuck you, and you just turn 90 degrees and go the other way, like, yeah, that's that's your prerogative. That's up to you. Um, yeah, or it's like, you know, driving a car. It's similar, similar analogy. Like, if you're, we're driving to your house. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I have, whatever. I have a map up there. I'm like, I know where your house is here. Cool, mm. right? And I'm driving to it. You're going to tell me, like, oh, if we actually go this way, there's, you know, it's a little bit quicker. There's always traffic on this road. There's a pothole here. Like, you know the way. So you're, you're the coach, you know? You yeah. can help guide me. But ultimately, it is my decision. I can be like, no, I actually prefer to, you know, avoid tolls or something. So yeah. I'm not going to go this way, even though it saves 15 minutes, mm-hmm. right? Or again, it's my prerogative to be like, right, well, actually, you know, this looks like a really nice scenic area. I'm going to s- spend more time on mm. this, you know, rather than you're saying this is quicker or this is a better protocol or whatever. I'm like, well, this is ultimately the way I want to go with things. And I think like if coaches can think like that, you know, where you're basically a, a passenger or like, you know, the navigator rather than thinking like they're the driver. Yeah. They actually provide a better service. But also if like the client in this instance or, you know, the individual that's, you know, surely they've, they're they following the advice from somewhere, you know, whether it's online or whatever, if they just think of like, okay, that's actually, you know, the passenger giving me advice. That doesn't mean that's what I have to do. You know, it's like, you know, your, your Google Maps or whatever. It's like, this is giving you the route doesn't mean like if you if you know a different route or you prefer a different route you know if you ultimately end in the same position it doesn't really matter you know and um, like to an extent even though it's a you know it doesn't work in all circumstances the end justifies the means <laughs> yeah. but um it, it, it doesn't matter really you know if you are getting to the end result however what can often happen is, you know, you try to go off on your own path. And even if you do this kind of, you know, the collaborative decision making, which we've talked about yeah. before and on the podcast, um, if you do this kind of collaborative decision making and they're still coming back with, you know, say what we'll, we'll say poor results or poor habits or they're, they're not actually, first of all, they could maybe not do in the actual stuff that they, they said they're going to do. Yeah. Um, and like, obviously, like you're saying, the more specific you can be with it the better because you know it's like what does this actually look like you said you're going to do this but that's that's you know that's just in the air like what does yeah, that actually often mean quite vague yeah it's very see. vague all the time you know and um, so if you can be more specific with that and go like these are the exact habits that we're going to engage in on a daily basis a weekly basis whatever yeah. it is right and um, people can still not do that right mm. or still do it poorly which you know that they're they're still trying their best yeah and this is what i think is the thing that throws people who are trying to be a better coach off and also people that are trying to be more um we we'll say honest with themselves around nutrition they push too hard for results rather than actually pushing hard to nail the process right so right like it, it's almost like they're they're looking for the the quantifiable before they're looking for the the qualitative mm. you know like they're not looking at uh oh how how am i actually doing this it's just like did i get the outcome did yeah. i lose five pounds did i lose the 10 kilos i wanted to lose you know mm. did i do x y and z and it's not like yeah okay are you actually engaging in the the habits regularly are you actually you know putting the time in in terms of perfecting the plan of action mm. for you rather than really hammering for the, the results you know yeah. and i think that is something that really throws off coaches because you can feel like people are effectively paying you for results you yeah. know like I, I want you to get me shredded in the next 16 weeks mm-hmm. right that's what i'm paying you for yeah right and 
you're going off and going like, look, you're not nailing these basic things that we really need to, to get in place to be successful. You have a poor relationship around food. Yeah. You keep going on these binge eating episodes and yeah. you know all that kind of stuff. And it's like, there has to be this dialogue, this conversation between those two, you know, the coach and the client, or again, if you're coaching yourself, you know, with yourself, um, you have to have this conversation where you have to be honest with what's going on. Are you just mm. pushing for the results and not actually respecting the process, not actually creating a process that is going to lead to results down the road? Um, or again, if you if you are coaching someone, you know, and they're they're effectively paying you for results um, and you're kind of in this position where you almost want to push them a little bit harder to ensure that you, you know, you justify you feel like you, you delivered you know, like, oh, that you're paying me yeah. for this. So I need to do this. But then you end up not actually providing them the service that's going to be beneficial for them for their lifetime. Yeah. Right. So like, how do you kind of get around that with these kind of, we'll say trickier clients that mm-hmm. are, you know, maybe they are struggling with their relationship with food or they're struggling with their relationships in general. Yeah. And that's causing their food to be, you know, off kilter. Yeah. Well, yeah, first of all, like I, I put a, a massive and heavy emphasis on the process, right? So I usually say to people uh, quite early on, it's like, you know, they could be dropping centimeters, dropping weight, but I'll say to them, like, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to flag that and highlight that as like a massive uh, mm. talking point in our check-ins because it only matters about the process mm. that you used to get there. It's almost a side effect. Exactly. You know, it's yeah. like, this is not the the end goal even though it may actually be no, the end goal it's the outcome um the analogy i use a lot is like if you're running a race like you can see the finish line you can see the outcome where you want to be but you're not going to get there until you start putting one foot in front of the other and that is the actual process so that that's what we get all the emphasis on so that's where all the all like the praise comes in so it's like you know you nailed these habits this week that's class that's better than it was last week fantastic um it's very rarely going to be oh, you dropped half a kilo this week. That's deadly. Well mm. done. Like, you're so great for that because that's out of your control mm. uh, to an extent. Like, your the behaviors are in your control. So you can engage with them over and over on a daily and weekly basis. Um, and then, like you said, it's a side effect that, you know, you happen to lose weight or you happen to get stronger or whatever it is. Um, because, and then what happens, like, you know, if, a, if it's a female client, she has a period, you know, weight goes up, it goes up that week. Like- does that mean you didn't do well that week well no because that then we look at the process so like what are the processes or habits that we want you to actually be doing so it's like i said all right like it's setting behavior goals and then trying to uh, take action and execute on those and that's how we measure progress really or success in a week um and like i said you, you can scale it back as far as you need to so the person is actually hitting those targets Mm. and like a lot of it is you know you're gonna like a huge part of the job you you know this yourself is managing expectations as Mm. well um so early on often we have to have a conversation about expectations it's like you know why why do you expect this rate of return um on your investment and it's it's usually arbitrary to some extent or it's modeled off um some heavily advertised six-week crash diet uh, and training program that like leaves someone a, a husk at the end like a leaner husk mm. albeit just with a husk and then they put the weight back on yeah, it's a smaller version of the same problems they had previously that's all it is you know? you've just put it off or, for yeah. six weeks you've man like any you know anyone can just get the head down and mm. use willpower and motivation to just, yeah to yeah we're in the digging phase here let's just do it but then what are you left with after that because mm. you've built no behaviors and you've built no habits you've built no processes and um, you've probably taken on a huge amount of behaviors that are probably good if you could actually build them so that they would last you mm. but instead i've just thrown a bunch of stuff at you and it's like all right do this and you're trying to juggle like 16 different balls that you've never held before um you're not you're not you're gonna go right and it's because it's so you know draining to do that as well you're gonna go right back to your own mm. your old lifestyle because that was fucking comfortable it was easy you knew yeah. how to do that so yeah heavily emphasize that it's uh, behavior goals and processes and that's what gets you the results as a side effect the one thing that i always and it really cements that whole thought process in my mind is like raising kids right so thinking that way when you're actually raising kids makes things so much easier in terms of actually getting them 
to do what you want them to do, right? And that sounds like you're manipulating them or something, but obviously, like, you're an adult, you know the path that, <laughs> you know, humans are supposed to go on, you want them to engage in things, habits, maybe you would call them, yeah. uh, that would lead to their success in life, right? So how do you actually get them to do that? Well, you praise the habits that are going to get them to that position. For example, you might remember from your childhood, you might be like, oh, you got um, good English grades, right? Mm -hmm. And you got shit maths grades, right? And your parents then said to you, well, oh, fantastic, you did great in English. That's because you're great at English, right? Mm. And then you're like, oh, here's my maths results. And they're like, that's okay. You're just not good at maths, right? And that just leaves you in a position where it's like, okay, I'm just not good at maths, so I'm always going to be bad at maths. It's predefined. You know, yeah. it's like, that's who you are as a person. So, mm. you know, it's like, oh, like that's that's fine. Whereas if you look at it from the, the, the habit-based change model, we'll call it, um, or what we're talking about ultimately, is if you are actually trying to help that child in this circumstance uh, be better for life, you wouldn't praise the result, you know? It's like, mm. yeah, cool. You did great in your English. Well, why did you do great in your English? Because you put in the work. You studied for this. You tried hard. You know, you might have a a natural aptitude for it, right? That's, that's, we're all inherent. You have to have that conversation with a child. It's like, you know, if your child has no legs and this other child has, you know, their Usain Bolt's child, it's like, like, you are, there is inherent differences, you know? So it's like, you, you have to be honest with children as well. I hate when people are like, we're all equals, like we're, we're physically not, mm-hmm. right? Um, so you, you have those conversations and yeah, maybe they're, they do have an inherent advantage in English. They're just, they're, their brain works like that a bit more, right? Yeah. But they're still getting these results because they're putting in the work to get that, right? Because if you start praising the hard work that they put in, then they actually have an avenue to get better at maths because they're like, mm. oh, hey, like I'm getting good results in English because I put in hard work and I work hard at it. You know, yeah, I'm getting bad results in maths because I don't engage in these habits. I don't put in this hard work and I don't get better at it as a result. Right. Mm. And that's how you should be thinking of this in terms of like actually coaching individuals and, you know, maybe you're raising your children. I'm not here to judge how you raise your children. <laughs> um, but praising them for the habits and the hard work that they put in is so much more rewarding and actually gets them on the path so much easier than if you're just like, oh, you're naturally good at English, you know? Because yeah. that doesn't, like, what happens then when they get a B in their English, yeah. you know? They're like, oh, shit, I, maybe I'm not just good, good at English, English yeah. you know? And then they're in this position where they they, did, they didn't know that it was the hard work that was getting them there. Yeah. They didn't know it was the habits that were getting them there. So they're like, I'm just not who I thought I was, Yeah. right? And that's the same with fat loss. It's the same with, like, training. It's the same with all that kind of stuff where it's like, you need to praise the, the habits, that are getting you to the position mm-hmm. rather than the actual outcome. Like, yeah, 100%. If your child comes home with an A, you're going to be like, phenomenal work, great, right? Yeah. That was because of the habits, right? Yeah. But if your child comes home with a C in maths and they've always been at terrible at maths, they're usually a, an E or a D student and they're like, I got a C. And you're like, that's phenomenal work because mm-hmm. you put in the hard work, you were putting in the habits, you were engaging in the habits that lead to success Let's yeah. go out and celebrate this C. So you can yeah. still celebrate the the results. We're not saying that that's a bad thing at all. No. But it's that the actual thing that we're trying to celebrate is the process, mm-hmm. the actual habits that you've engaged in to get you to that end result. Yeah. And one thing I often ask people, like as we're going through the, the coaching process, is because I want to make them very aware of what they're doing that's leading to success, like you've just been mm-hmm. talking about. So... Uh, I like to get them to imagine like a playbook, you know, so like say if you if your mind was erased right here today and you wake up tomorrow and you're just like shit, I need to I need to lose five kilos but I don't know anything else. Mm. But you have Patty's playbook from before, there's this usually a, br- a blueprint of what you need to do. Um so all your habits are gonna be in there. It's like, okay, so all right, according to this, I don't remember any of this, but according to this, I trained five times a week, I ate this much protein, I ate this many servings of vegetables a day, I got this much sleep, this much steps, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I want them to relay that back to me, so mm. it just affirms it for them. Like, I like I know already, but I want yeah. them to have to actually state it. And, and because as well, because you're going to pick up on individual differences there as well. So people have different strengths and weaknesses, 
and they're going to have figured out creative ways uh, around whatever like individual roadblocks they had mm. in their process um so it's going to be specific to them rather than like i know like all those things i said there are, are the main things really but uh, to get more specific that's i like to ask people that uh, on a regular basis so like as we're going through like usually when someone's doing pretty well it's okay i want you to think about why are you doing well here um and i guess i'm just to reflect on it and like solidify is okay yeah these are the things i do um you know another one that i like is to when it comes to making better choices is to prompt yourself it's like okay what would the person that i'm trying to be mm. do in this situation um you know with a chocolate bar they eat the, app, the apple um you know they're kind of tired you know i just want to sit on the couch here and watch tv uh but i have another five thousand steps to hit today okay it's not like what am i going to do right now but it's the person that i want to be in three months time what would they probably do in this situation yeah it's like creating that kind of identity yeah of a, a healthy person or whoever it is that you want to be maybe you want to yeah. be a tyrant like what would a tyrant <laughs> do in, in this position <laughs> exactly like, that's what you want to be thinking like you know um, and creating that identity around it obviously has benefits you know mm-hmm. yeah absolutely which one we want to next <laughs> so uh, i think that covers quite a bit right but if you are a coach and you are coaching people that do have a a poorer relationship mm-hmm. with food and you're, you're trying to take this stuff on board you're trying to be like okay so we need to focus on the the process we need to focus on you know the habits that they're engaging in and um, maybe we aren't going to you know push fat loss or whatever it is right now we're just going to focus on nailing the habits like i was covering the coach's corner i say that because you're in the coach's corner so you know um but uh i was covering the coach's corner the other day in terms of like creating timelines and stuff and there's a few lessons that are coming up in that um but you know w- when i'm going through a case study in there i'm like here's the the three or four different things that you know if we have x amount of time this is the the option that we can go to yeah. if we have less time it's like this is the option we can go to this is the option that your client's probably going to want you know yeah and it's like this is the you know, best case scenario or like whatever it is you know there's different options available to you right but let's say we have an individual that you know they've struggled they've they're 30 years old you know mm. and not that that's old because we're both nearly there but <laughs> anyway they're 30 years old um and they've struggled their whole life with their weight or whatever it is, their relationship with food overall, right? And you as a coach, or again, this individual listening, they're like, I want to change, right? Yeah. They start going for these habits, but they're not actually noticing any results, right? So they're engaging in these objectively healthful habits, Mm -hmm. but there's no quantifiable measurable results right yeah. in this case it's fat loss that's what they, the individual is looking for you know like they're not realistically tracking like health metrics they're not like oh my nutrient status is mm, has improved or thing. anything like that they're, they're just like i step on the scales i'm the same weight mm. i feel like i'm doing everything right because i think this is the situation that coaches find themselves in a lot where again like we were saying earlier on like you feel like you're being paid to yeah. get results um so you know you you might want to push people a little bit harder but if we're in someone's bought into the whole process they're like yeah look i'm i'm willing to you know just work on my habits we won't even look at the scales or whatever it is Mm. right but then we step on the scales in a month's time two months time and it's the exact same position that we're in you know yeah they got stronger they feel a little bit healthier they feel less inflamed like there's a load of like subjective and objective stuff that you know has been going right yeah but they still in their head they're like I want to be moving in the a certain direction with my weight. Mm. You know, how do you, how do you communicate with that individual? Like, how do you, do you push for progress? Do you talk to them differently in terms of, okay, we're going to be st- stuck here. Cause that's what they feel like. They're like, you're stuck here, just engaging in these habits, but you don't actually get results. You know, and you're just one of those people. And it, and is this assuming where are we assuming they're going wrong here? Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, do we, do we go like, you're doing something wrong or do we go like okay well it's just a we're actually looking at it more from a we'll say a nutritional science perspective then we're just like okay well actually you know we are actually just eating too many calories you know Mm. whatever it is like obviously ultimately we all know that's the situation that it is it's like calories they're dictating everything yeah right so do we then go okay we need to modify these habits so that we can modify the caloric load that we're Mm. eating and or do we need to talk to them differently in terms of 
you know, reframe their, their, their thought of the scales, you know, cause that can also be an issue where people are like, I, I'll only be happy when I'm 60 kilos or whatever yeah. it is, you know? Yeah. And you're like looking at them and it's like, you've gained five kilos of muscle and lost five kilos of fat. It's like, yeah, your weight is the same, but like objectively these two people in these photos are completely different, yeah, you know? And yeah. um, so like, how do you talk to the client that is not getting results? You know, and obviously that that's a the broadest question I <laughs> yeah. could give you. You know, it's like as if there's one one singular like not getting results phenotype or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, well, I mean, like if if they have no if they don't have any issues with their relationship with food, and there's nothing like getting in the way in that sense, then yeah, would you? I would just look at, and it depends how long this has been going on as well. Because like, say if someone has just doesn't just lacks the habits completely starting out like it's it's pretty reasonable to take a month to just get them yeah solid right um and then you set yourself up for even faster Whatever progress you want to do in the future yeah right? and it will be easier and it won't be like oh i'm just just about managing to do these things mm. and yeah we're seeing some progress but i'm like feeling like i'm walking on thin ice here and it could all fall apart soon like yeah like i always think that's the best case scenario in terms of if you could spend eight weeks and all you're focusing on is healthful habits yeah right? and then you could be like okay now we can focus on fat loss or now we can focus yeah. on really like pushing muscle gain or whatever it is because i know like two months is a good enough chunk of time where it's like mm. you can nail these things down any little things that come up you understand protocols around that yeah but obviously again like you can be in a position where even after those eight weeks they're like well I, i've got the habits nailed down but i still yeah. want to see some results yeah well i mean like that's that's a tough position to be in as a coach because especially if you don't know if you can't figure out why mm. they're not getting results um because like you said you, you are hired to help this person get results and yeah you may have, you've got them healthier um they're eating much better like you do see that i'm sure you see mm -hmm. that a lot as well where this person's like on paper their healthfulness and their behaviors mm. are like completely different compared to when they started even though the weight on the scales may not be that different mm -hmm. or the measurements might not be that might not be that different i mean it's unlikely yeah, yeah to happen usually going to be some change. yeah like if you've, you've made a lot of positive changes mm. um so like oh yeah you're going to go and look at like the energy balance and like trying to figure out as a coach why why is this not working or what it's it's not even about it not working it's like okay perfect you've um you know you've nailed all these behaviors that's excellent that's always excellent because if you're doing that you're always going to be successful mm. uh in a week or a month or whatever it is that's why you put so much emphasis on the behaviors and the processes so like this class you've done all that now we just need to tweak it um in so whatever way point it more in a certain direction yeah and then it's like and then it'll start rolling in um for the most part i think that's that's what the case is going to be um but also like having an honest dialogue obviously with them as well like is important um like if you say hmm okay i'm not sure why this is happening but let's try this mm. um you know i think people appreciate that rather than you know you're trying to make up some bullshit yeah, yeah, yeah. about it like don't do that that's that's bad coaching protocol yeah like um, the reason i, I asked this is because i know people try to use this information and try to get results and then again eight weeks down the line when their client comes to them and goes oh we haven't really like got results they feel like they're a failure you know but like as you were just saying there it's not really a, a failed process you know it's not actually a failure because you've got this individual to engage in these healthful mm. habits they're actually pushing towards you know being a healthier human overall which yeah. is you know generally the the goal and while yeah fat loss might be part of that for some you know people um it's not always to be all an end all you know um but again like you might have these clients that are like i i want to lose five kilos mm. and i've been engaging in all these habits and you know i haven't lost the five kilos and while yes i'm stronger fitter yeah. you know leaner or not leaner that's what they're cool. trying to do <laughs> yeah it's fine um, it's fine for me to say yeah. let's not get attached to the outcome but at some point with well, some point you, you, you need to do to, look at the outcome because that's the yeah. person is there for that's what they're, they're paying you for. um and it, it would be a cop-out to just be like oh yeah but yeah, your, good, your behaviors yeah. are good like a year later and you know your behavior is really good but there's no there's no change mm. how you want it uh, as a client so like you know you're gonna have to give them what they need first um and some of what they want and then 
you know, if they've done what they need to do, then you're left with what they want to do. And it's like, yeah. okay, let's do this then. And then again, it is literally just a process of like, okay, you've nailed the habits. So I know all I have to do is, yeah, like maybe there are other habits that then have to be brought in because, you know, mm-hmm. you've been eating that, we'll say calorie maintenance if you're the same, yeah. you know, and now it's like, we're actually going to push a bit of a deficit. Maybe there's some habits that go along with yeah. that, like, you know, maybe increasing food volume a bit more where, mm-hmm. you know, that wasn't as big of a concern beforehand because, you know, you had more calories to yeah. play with. Now you're like, oh, I'm noticing I'm a bit hungrier as it comes to bedtime, you know, yeah. you have to come in with new habits and, you know, strategies to, to overcome that. So, you know, habits might change overall, but, and I think this is important for coaches to to realize and for individuals that are trying to do this themselves is that, okay, like the, engaging in all these habits that lead to better health was perfectly fine. There might be a point where, again, like you said, we, we have to change things a little bit to really like point them in the direction that they want to go in in terms of, you know, fat loss or whatever it is. But even when we do that, you know, like, again, like objectively, all we're really doing is finding some way to manipulate calories you mm. know maybe it's again like the the habit you've been given giving them to do is like have like a a portion of carbohydrates with each meal or you know maybe you're using a portion control method and you're like two thumbs of fat or whatever yeah. it is that you're using you're like okay now all i want you to do is bring that down to one thumb of yeah. fat you know so the habit just is tweaked a little bit yeah but then that re- results in a calorie deficit yeah. and then that results in you know weight change in the direction that they're they're trying to to push for you know so i think that is important for for individuals both you know coaches and their their clientele and and obviously coaches or people who are coaching themselves to realize that just because you haven't really pushed for these results and you've done all the good stuff in terms of you you've got better habits and you're Mm. healthier and whatever that doesn't mean that you're not on the path right yeah that just means that you haven't been as directed with your path you know you've been on this like meandering road towards the end goal yeah. and now you just want to go okay look no we're getting up in a drone and we're just going straight for it you know mm. it's like as the crow flies i want to be as direct as possible yeah. you know and that's perfectly fine like certain points in time like that's that's you've, what you need you put yourself in a position to actually do that yeah if you spend you know one month two months actually just getting yourself set up you're gonna make you're gonna make short work of it like you're gonna yeah. you're gonna absolutely smash it at that point because all those things are built already um so yeah it's it's it'd be a class position to be in um if you can you know wait until and you can buy into that that okay these are the kind of things i need to have up and running and you don't need to have everything up and running mm. like nailed down perfectly um before you can start getting results like obviously not but it depends on the person how much work they need to do like some people do you need a month of like foundational work i call it like so okay we need to bring you up to a point where you can actually start getting results mm. um i'll just i'll explain like i'll explain why that's the case um and you know you help people understand why it is then you know they're usually pretty okay with it uh or you know one that i see an awful lot is like someone who has dieted for maybe a long time uh they want to come work with me because they've plateaued and you know they're eating 1300 calories a day and they're quite active and it's like okay i want to keep keep going here and it's like all right well that's like getting more fat loss right now is probably mm. not the best that's idea. not what we need right now no we're like we probably have to reverse diet here and um, we pretty need you to build you build you back up to ma- or not bring you back up to maintenance and then build on your like metabolism and your capacity to handle calories um and you know because that person's if they've already been doing that themselves um, gotten to that point where they've lost a bunch of weight like they probably have decent habits um so it's like okay maybe we reverse diet for you know two months three months um then we can then your calorie intake will be much higher and then maybe do a mini cut and you lose a bunch of bunch of fat tissue in two or three weeks and you come back to maintenance and you can have like a happy you life you're, see where you're, you're off go, into yeah, the yeah. sunset like um you know so that like in that person that, that happens to me a lot where okay y- your goal is fat loss we have to bring you back up to maintenance and build that up a little bit. And then I can get you fat loss. But explain mm. to the person what you're doing. Um, and, you know, if, if they trust, they build some rapport, get some buy-in. Um, I haven't had it yet. That person's like, no, that's that sounds shit. Yeah, like, we're I'm, not doing that. I'm not doing that. Especially like, when you're like, look, at the very least, we'll stay the same and you get to eat more calories. You yeah. know, people are like, <laughs> yeah, it's fucking great. Like people love it when I, I you, think when I, might, I might go for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, um, 
yeah, pe- people do enjoy it. It's like, all right, we're getting more, like, training going well. You know yourself, like, body composition generally tends to improve uh, when you do that. People feel better. Uh, it's like, okay, you might set them a target. It's okay, okay, we can get you up to, you know, 18, 1900 calories. Then we can do a mini cut, like, when you're maintaining reasonably well on that. So that's and kind it's of not the like, it's not magic, because I know whenever, like, first of all, reverse dieting is a terrible name. Um, well, it's actually a great name, but the name that it's gotten for itself then after the fact, you know, people are like, oh, it's like adding 50 calories to your Oh, that's a short yeah. reverse. But that's oh, what, I don't mean that reverse. But diet. I know, but that's what people right. think of in terms of their... their Five their, grams their, of carbs. Yeah, they're like, oh yeah, whatever. Um, and, you know, maybe there is a place for that. But what we're talking about here is, you know, your metabolism, you know, we'll call it that. Um, it's your like niche and, you know, even thyroid output and like Being your smaller. ability, your ability to train hard, you know, glycogen stores, like all that kind of stuff are all kind of depressed when you're been dieting for a while, like leptins changed, all these other things. Like we've talked about diet adaptations before with articles on it. You know, there's stuff in the coach's corner on it. Like there, there's stuff there, but in this context, we're just talking about, you know, bringing calories up to a maintenance level so that, you know, energy actually returns to the body mm. where you're like, and I mean that in terms of actual energy, in terms of like carbohydrates, fats, that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm actually, I know I have a target of 10,000 steps per day, but I'm, you know, I notice that I'm fidgeting on top of that. You know, I mm. notice that, you know, uh, my energy is great throughout the day, whereas before I had to have four coffees just to, yeah. to get through the day. And like, I noticed that, you know, I hadn't been progressing in the gym and now I'm, you know, adding more weight. And it's like, that's, there's no magic to it, you know? Mm. Obviously, you do have to know when to bring that kind of stuff in. Um, yeah. But, like, again, like, you do find this with a lot of clients where they, they come to you and they've been dieting for forever and they've been engaging yeah. in these habits. They're like, yeah, these are, you know, objectively healthful habits. But, again, maybe the calories are inappropriate to continue pushing yeah. this stuff. It's like they've, they've bottomed out and they expect you to have the magic fix. Yeah. And it's like, all right, I can, I can help you here, but in what will look like a roundabout way. Yeah, it's not going to be the way you think I'm going to approach it. Yeah, this. it's not like, this is, no, this is the one food you've been missing from your diet, that's why you're not missing. It's potassium, that's what you were missing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, it works It works really well. And obviously that's for people listening, like to bring them back up to their new maintenance, which is not the same as their old same, maintenance because yeah. they're smaller and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, usually, well, I do like 10, 15% usually. Yeah, I just go on the individual. But in the coach's corner, just shameless plug, <laughs> there's about three lessons that is going to be pl- well, planned on this stuff. So we'll okay. save the secrets. You're in there, so you'll see them. <laughs> you know my approach then. So look, if people want, they're listening to this and they're like, oh yeah, like I actually wouldn't mind reading a bit more about this, looking at videos a bit more about this. That's where you find it. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, do you have anything else that you want to touch on before I hit you with the, the, the final question? Because I think that's given... What we do- we didn't really touch on like uh, we can touch on whatever the fuck you want oh well, like did we say we, want, we wanted to get into like uh how to manage kind of emotional eating or let's that go rela- that relationship with food i'm in why that might happen I'm that in. people have a poor life okay <laughs> all right i don't know how we've gone on so <laughs> they'll get into that but sure look um you know okay so say say i do have someone who has a poor relationship with mm. food um you know, very good question to ask someone. Like, that might be the goal that they set in their intake form. Uh, question I'll always hit them with is, how would you describe your relationship with food right now? And in three months' time, if it was much better, how would you know? What would that feel like? What would that look like? What would be different than it is right now? Okay. I always use the magic wand. I'm like, if <laughs> we had a magic wand, yeah, and I was to say, in three months, six months' time, you're going to have a perfect diet, a perfect relationship with food. What would that look like for you? you know? mm. And again, then you get a lot of insight. And how it would feel, yeah. Because yeah, a magic wand is like, it's a magic wand. It can, it can do anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 100%. So, do you know where I can get one of those? Or I have one over here. I, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll edit that out. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that gives you the idea of like, you know, where the person wants to be and what their issues might be. So a lot of the time, like, for the people I'm working with, it's like it's binge eating um, that they struggle with. And, you know, very often, right, someone who's binge eating, may, well, not always, but very often, like, this person also wants to lose weight at the same time because the binge eating has contributed such a large calorie yeah. surplus that um, they've put on a lot of weight they want to lose. Uh, so those those goals often go in tandem. Um, but really, I do say to people, it's like, okay, look, if, you know, if you're binging a couple of times a week or whatever the frequency is, 
Um, if it's reasonably frequent, it's like, okay, we have to address that first. Mm. Um, because there's no point in you just saying, okay, I need to be li-, like, we're talking about outcomes. Like I need to be lighter in two weeks time, but I've, you know, I've binged a couple of times, just r- racked up a lot of calories and it, it's, it makes it almost impossible. Mm. Um, so we have to address the, the binge eating first. Like obviously, you know, if you binge once every six months, like it's not going to yeah, make exactly. a difference, but I'm talking about, well, it might, if you're particularly good at binging yeah maybe <laughs> yeah that's not a challenge you know, to anybody um so we look at why are they binging right so you know the most common ones are going to be uh sort of food labeling or this uh saying this food is good this food is bad mm-hmm. kind of food fear um i can't eat these because they are horrendous for health or whatever it is um so you need to address that it's like okay so and a lot of this like we we're talking about involves a lot of dialogue so okay so what is it about these foods that you think are so inherently harmful um you know what why is why is dark chocolate cool but milk chocolate is not like wh- yeah what's the percentage how, change where does it go 70 yeah where's the line yeah, like, is it 65 what it, like yeah and like you test your bars to make sure it's, it's pure like that like it says um and like those are literally the kind of yeah. questions because that helps people like kind of triggers the rational side of their brain like, like these rules are kind of arbitrary yeah and again they're often created by the person probably informed by some misinformation bullshit somewhere now, or even good information but they're 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 taking it to too far of a degree in terms of mm-hmm. they're like these are healthy foods and they're like okay that means i can only eat these yeah. foods like the information could be you know yeah. good um but they're 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 not implementing it in a we'll say a holistic manner, even though I hate that word, <laughs> a holistic manner in terms of, you know, actually looking at their their life in terms of what that actually means in terms of the foods that they eat, how they interact with people, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, the, yeah, there, there's that aspect and get people to examine, like, why why do they have these food rules? One that I actually see a lot is, like, uh, a sort of learned behavior from maybe mm. when they are kids, like, living at home. So people actually inherit a lot of, poor relationship with the food because like maybe their their parents are talking maybe their parents struggled with their weight and yo-yo diet and are talking about foods being good or bad and that's what they've learned um in the home where they grew up and um, you get this whole thing to like you know finish your plate or as or as you can't have ice cream um, i always finish my plate that's why i was a fat <laughs> fat kid uh always got that ice cream and it's like <laughs> it's like <laughs> they they only um the only cue is like, yeah, okay, I'm finished my plate. Now my dinner is yeah, over. Yeah. Rather than like, all right, I'm fucking I'm stuffed to yeah. the brim here. I should have stopped maybe a quarter of the plate ago. And that is a real Irish thing as well. Like, obviously, yeah. like we have a huge Irish audience where it's like, finish your plate. I don't know if it's from the like, famine or something, but it's like, you know, finish your plate. Like, there's also like the, tr- the troker boxes. That's there what I was going to say. Like, like, people are like, oh, those starving kids in Africa. Yeah. Like, I could not tell you the amount of times I was told that as a child, yeah. but also how frequently other people were told that yeah. uh, when we were growing and up anyway it makes a know? difference it's like oh you need to finish your food because you know if we throw that out somehow they get extra starvation <laughs> there's extra plague yeah. or extra whatever that's going on it's like you're you're a child like you don't know no you, you're, tr- you're just you like, trust what you're told you're like, oh yeah. okay if i don't finish this, these african kids like i see this fucking w- girl on the thing that's starving here i'm like oh, of course i want to help yeah you know yeah um yeah, so people have this these these labels on foods, um, why they can eat some and why they can't eat others. Uh, and then, you know, so that's just the restriction setting. So you're setting yourself up to probably binge on those foods because you tell yourself categorically, I cannot have those. Mm. Um, eventually, you're going to have them probably in some capacity because it's often a, a massive list of foods as well. Yeah. So and also, it's not even that it's you're eventually going to have them. What's going to happen is you're going to like you might have like x y and z are bad foods but you're going to go out to i don't know a christening or something whatever it is and you're not going to be able to eat your approved list of foods and then all of a sudden you've eaten off your approved list list Mm. of foods so i'm already off plan in a small way you know so i've actually really been craving those bad foods yeah so all of a sudden you're like well i'm already off plan so let's go in it's kind of like a a gateway drug if you will (laughs) let's get after it yeah um and then you'll and then you'll say shit like i i've made a balls of that and now i have to be even more restrictive and like you know the way you 
the way your brain's looking at that is like, I may never eat these foods again, mm. ever. Because that's that's basically what you're telling yourself. It's like, these foods are off limits, so never have them. Um, so what's it going to do when you finally give in? Mm. Uh, in inverted commas, if you're not watching this. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to make the most of it, essentially, uh, and really go hard at it. And then you just put yourself in a, in a terrible position. So to try and address that, I mean, like, actually tracking food is not is often not useful in in these kind of cases but in this specific one it's like you know if i (laughs) i give you one calorie worth of granola which is a bad food um has that made a difference to your goals your progress no so i usually get people to write a list and it's like which are the worst uh, Mm -hmm. in your mind which are the least bad of the bad bunch and you start with those ones start implementing a little bit of those uh on a, on a daily or weekly basis whatever it is and then people start to see okay this actually isn't fucking up all my progress and all my results i'm actually eating a wider variety of food i'm not freaking out when i go out to eat or um you know spontaneously go for food with friends or something whatever it is um so that's it that's how you get on that sort of path and you know like i always say this like these things take time and repetition so it's not like oh my god Pat, did you not know that you can have 50 calories of granola and you're fine oh Thank you for enlightening me. Yeah, it's not it's solved. Not, it's not. That's not it. Like, mm. it doesn't mean tomorrow that you wake up and you're like, oh no, I can't have a granola. And sometimes there is even like situations where like granola is actually a good one because it's a little bit of a, a different mouthfeel and stuff like that. Like it's kind of crunchy and stuff. Where people can have a situation where it's not even necessarily the granola. It's the the different sensory input that they get, mm. and you know that can put them off onto a path where they overconsume food then right it's mm-hmm. not even that like it's a bad food or anything it's just like the inherent qualities of this food put them in a position where they're they start wanting to eat more right and that's actually something that's really hard to to deal with um, and again that would then be like okay so this might not actually be a bad food in terms of any inherent qualities to it apart from you know the the mouthfeel or whatever mm-hmm. so we're actually going to deal with this last even though you've put it down here as a a less bad food and maybe that's one that we would target you know to like bring that in but yeah. we've actually identified that you know every time you eat granola you binge eat then because you know you like the the crunch it, yeah. you know, I know it brings up childhood memories or something you know um, and you're like oh yeah I, I, I overeat then when I do that you know and even though you've ranked it as like this, this isn't too bad of a yeah. food it might be like okay so this habit of eating this food yeah. leads to these other quote unquote bad habits so yeah, it's a, we'll deal with that later because it's not necessarily uh it's a red light habit exactly it yeah. leads to more yeah. less positive behaviors so we're like okay we that's something that we actually need to deal with all those other behaviors as well mm. so it's not just this one behavior so i just wanted to mention that because i know like people try to implement this stuff and then they're like geez i tried that and this person was just over consuming so much then mm. as a result you know yeah. it's, not, it's not just black and white like there are no. nuances to this and it takes time to you know, unravel these mental blocks people have about around different foods. But like I said, it's a lot of dialogue, um, a lot of kind of poking at them to challenge these beliefs that they seem to hold around certain foods being good or bad or whatever it is. So, you know, why is that the case? Why is this food good? Why is this food bad? And so on and so forth. In what context? Um, you know, when I say a lot is like, you know, Paddy, if you're stranded on uh, a god awful desert island somewhere, like there's not a mango in sight, you are probably a shy fisherman, so you're not catching any fish. That's incorrect. That's incorrect. <laughs> yeah. um, but somehow I get to fly a drone in, drop a, a 24 uh, can pack of Coca Cola in, full sugar version. Can I uh, have Pepsi instead? You can have Pepsi, yeah. Uh, I'll get I respect consent that. on that. I respect um, that. You know, so that's the only food source or energy source you have available. Like, is that food good or bad? Like, in that context, it's the best thing you've ever seen in your life because that's going to keep you alive for however long I decide you're stuck on that island for. Um, so the context matters uh, mm. and helping people see that. And it's like, okay, yeah, you know, if I have two large pizzas in the context of my weekly intake, that's pretty tough to manage. But, you know, if I have a slice or two, yeah, no, that's that's actually manageable. Um, so that that's very important. And then, you know, often people... I think, like you said at the start, their issues with self-esteem or some other emotional, psychological issues can just manifest in eating behaviors. Um, you know, that, that can be 
quite tricky to to weed out and see what's actually going on there. You may not be able to handle that yourself. Uh, you may need to access the services of a mental health professional, um, which no one wants to do when you say that. Like I say it all the time, like you need to go to a psychologist and they're like, I know. No. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, that's the next step here. We can continue yeah. hammering on these other habits. And, and then you, you have to start motivationally interviewing them yeah, to get around a, that. Which is another story in and <laughs> yeah. of itself. Um, but it's like, just accept like people, we have all this like mental health acceptance things and people will happily go to a psychologist about their anxiety or mm. their depression or whatever it is Hopefully. but then you know uh, it's a lot more accepted mm. these days right but if you tell someone it's like you actually need to go to a psychologist or psychiatric help maybe i don't know um, yeah. <laughs> about your relationship with food because there's a lot of underlying stuff that needs to be dealt with before we can actually you know deal with this stuff mm. and even if it is you just go to a counselor and just talk just yeah you know like we said that's what a lot of it is a lot of it is just talking talking, you know and maybe that isn't something that you want to talk with your coach with or again like if you are a coach maybe you don't feel you're equipped to to deal that with deal with that Mm. or again maybe it's not part of the service in terms of you know you're like i I, the the money i'm charging is not you know representative like you want to help the individual but it's like i have to do you know three hours of just talking per week with this individual it's like Mm. they're Char- you're not charging the price for that is effectively what i'm saying um no. so again that that can be hard for individuals themselves that are like i don't want to go to a psychologist you know and maybe you don't that's perfectly fine but you need to find someone that you can talk to that will mm. be you know impartial in their listening you know and they'll yeah they'll carefully guide the conversation yeah, they'll prompt to, you you know when actually yeah um but yeah like you, you you know you need to find that um if you're not gonna do it yourself as a coach and like it's yeah it's you obviously don't want to overstep your boundaries and start getting into the wrong lane that you're not supposed to be in um but what you can do as a coach always is help a person develop more awareness of why this might be happening so maybe along with their food diary you have them record their emotional state at the time um or different things like that so it's like okay we can see that uh you know you had an argument with your partner uh, at point a and then a little bit later on point b you binge binge ate Mm. um you know maybe is that a a sign of just trying to alleviate the stress because like the eating here is a solution rather than being a problem Mm. um but the way i describe it is like if you have a toolbox there beside you to cope with uh negative you know people eat emotionally when it's positive as well when they're happy um but if if you open that that open up that toolbox and all you have in there is you know go raid the fridge that's your only coping mechanism that's all you're gonna do Mm. you know because your body and your brain perceives a threat it wants to get rid of that it wants to get you out of that painful situation which you have learned um but you've learned you've picked up the habit or you just never picked up any other ones that might complement it uh to also help you cope um you're gonna go and do that like no question and it's very very um reasonable Mm. to expect that you know it's not that uh, and like i mean there's a lot of different ways that this manifests uh sometimes like a control thing like Mm -hmm. life is not especially in like the actual like we'll say the clinical manifestations of this like anorexia and bulimia and stuff like they're very much about like control Mm. um but like that like i don't I don't coach people on that stuff. Yeah, I'm not that's a, that's a referee job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a, a solution to what, whatever the problem is, and if that solution happens to be just to eat a lot, then that's where you're going to go for. Um, because in the moment, it's going to improve your situation, and then once you stop eating, you know you, you feel shit and you start beating yourself up about it. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Like I'm gonna have to report this. How do you know? Uh, and our check-in and and this sucks but if you can understand you know why that behavior is happening i mean i mentioned earlier that um you know behaviors are indicative of priorities Mm. so the priority at that moment in time was to feel better Mm. to alleviate that stress to get away from that threat um because that's what your body senses so it says okay yes i've got the perfect solution to this go get the cookies and this works so maybe it's a case that you need to fill that toolbox with other tools Maybe you need to try uh, meditation or mindfulness, talking to somebody, and maybe seeing a counselor, which is it's the same thing. Like it's talking to someone in a, who's more, more professional, more better trained to be able to give you that sort of mm. uh, feedback and advice. 
um, whatever it may be. Um, and you can create like an if then scenario. So like if I'm feeling stressed and you know now because you've developed this awareness that this may lead to binge eating, then I will go for a walk or something mm-hmm. take you out of that situation. Um, so those are, you know, some of the, the primary ways that uh, we try and deal with that. But like I said, it's very individual case to case, depending on what that person's situation is. Um, and like it's a lot of talking and dialogue yeah. Um, helping them with their own thoughts, their own self-esteem a lot of the time. Um, and then how so just interconnected with food and their other habits here. Yeah, and as we were just saying before the, the podcast, like developing a framework for that stuff mm-hmm. is actually really hard to do, you know, which obviously makes like our job here in terms of communicating that extra hard. Because I'm like, yeah. how can I just in this hour and a half or whatever podcast, yeah. how can I impart the the framework everything you need you know? yeah to, uh, to like fix you obviously this. can't you know and this is why obviously you know work with coaches join the coaches corner like engage in those kind of services talk to a counselor do all that stuff like it's all mm. informing if you are a coach like it, it is all informing how you actually approach other individuals you know yeah like i would think as well like you know if you are someone that does work with people with disordered eating we'll say or yeah you know uh, and whatever you want to call it, it yeah. um then talking to a counselor yourself can be beneficial you know mm-hmm. in terms of just paying them for their time in terms of you know the, engaging in the service and asking them the kind of stuff that they would approach you know like they they it, it also helps you expand your network in terms of you're like yeah. i want to refer out to someone like and you have someone that's like i've talked to this person i know their approach to things yeah i think it's a, a good approach and they seem like a nice person etc whatever you know um then you know Mm. you know um, and yeah, it's a good idea so is there anything else you would like to touch on no i'm, I'm satisfied now that we actually got on to the topic that we to said it. we were going to talk about yeah. at the start you couldn't like, imagine you cut that off and say, i could easily do that it's my podcast I can yeah. Do what I want. <laughs> yeah spoiler alert we actually didn't cover what you came here for <laughs> um i don't know what you're going to put as the title of this now no, I, I come up with the titles caption. as soon as i'm uploading them i'm like oh, what do i need to think of <laughs> <laughs> Gary usually then tries to change them, but I do most of the work anyway. So yeah, yeah. Um, your vote carried more weight. So metaphorically and physically, uh, physically mm. especially because I'm jacked. We're the uh, same weight now. I think. Well, I'm like 92. You're only like 91. I can see by mm, looking at 92, you visually. 92, 93. <laughs> yeah, most days. Um, anyway, yeah. we have one final question, which is related to all of this stuff that we've been talking about Mm -hmm. but it is if you could tell people to engage in one habit or you know habits um to improve their health what would it be just one just one habit i have one that's kind of like if you had one wish you wish with three more wishes but i won't give that um will i (laughs) i think that people should do more of the things that are important to them whatever that may be for that individual so the habit the first habit there is going to be to <laughs> identify what those are and then, these are and, the four then <laughs> and then try to implement that because this is something i've noticed a lot lately is that like you know if you were to ask somebody you know what what things do you enjoy doing on a regular basis and they might give you a you know a list of five things or whatever it's like how many times did you do those things in the last week or two weeks four, or a month? And it's like, I'm none. It's like, do you really? Like, yeah. um, maybe, maybe you'd be happier and enjoy yourself or enjoy your life a little bit more if you were actually doing some of those things. Like, yeah, I think that's a big thing as well where people have a load of hobbies when they're younger mm. and then as they get older, they're like, I just don't engage with them. You know, but they still have like the identity of those things. Yeah. You know, like say for example, like you played football when you're younger mm. and you're like, oh yeah, I play football. I really like football. It's like, when was the last time you even kicked the ball? And it's yeah. like, oh, about four years ago. It's why? Like, what? Like you enjoy or, it. I mean, we know why a lot of the time, but having identified that, can you actually implement it then? Mm. Um, yeah, no, I just think people uh, don't do enough of the stuff that they actually really like which especially when you whip out their phone and there's like five hours of (laughs) scrolling on instagram on it you know you're like i think like you have time yeah you know to do it at least to in some extent Mm. you know i know that's kind of an obscure answer but uh 
that is something that's come to me lately that's important do more of what you love and let it kill you is it find what you love and let it kill you yeah that's the line yeah don't know who said it but uh, I think it was uh, Ronnie Coleman <laughs> <laughs> uh, the bodybuilder king philosopher yeah, yeah. anyway um, I have nothing else to say you know our the usual sus if you're listening to this all of the stuff Brian's stuff will be linked below all of our stuff will be linked below I don't think you have coaching spaces think you, you don't fit the fit no, clinic no no the fit clinic yeah. the fit clinic does but you particularly um not me right now but no. there's other but people there that could potentially help there I go so visit the, the it'll fit. be linked don't even worry about it it'll be linked okay be linked. <laughs> um and then obviously like we have coaching spaces available and the coaches corner and obviously as always you know join the facebook group join the email list and you will be notified when stuff like this posts and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, guys, as we always say, it is too easy. I'll see you next week.